This is a talk which is, the reason I want to talk about this subject is not because I know a lot about uh, Kerberos. Um, I'm a lawyer, which means I don't know a lot about Kerberos, but I'm just using it as an example of a protocol which seems to be a public protocol which has aspects of it which are um, in the private domain and subject to the legal regime. I want to talk about this so that I can really end up talking about the way the law works uh, in technology. Um, the interplay between law and technology and how they, how they affect each other. And I'll go through an outline uh, in a second. This is a subject that I've been interested in for a long time, and so a plug for my book, which is available upstairs, which is just full of articles about law and technology, from uh, AI to uh, encryption and a variety of other things. The, the problem with, um, well, let me just go quickly through a couple of uh, disclaimers. Um, I'm going to be discussing Microsoft to some extent today, and Microsoft's um, extensions to the uh, Kerberos uh, protocol. Um, and again, one disclaimer here is that I represent Sun Microsystems, and I represent Sun Microsystems in a case against Microsoft. Um, everything that I'm going to be talking about here was developed before I started uh, that representation. All of this material that I'm going to be mentioning and in the materials is in the public domain. There's nothing uh, in this presentation that has anything to do with that case or my role in that case. But you need to know take everything I say about Microsoft with a couple of grains of salt um, because uh, I do represent Sun Microsystems. Uh, and the other um, disclaimer, of course, is that, again, I am a lawyer. There are people in this room who know a lot more about encryption and, uh, and Kerberos than I do. And I, again, I'm just using this protocol as an example of how uh, uh, public uh, standards are affected by the, by the, domain, of, uh, by the domain of legal rules. So just quickly an outline of what I'm going to go over. Um, the, this presentation and a lot of supplementary materials are in the uh, materials that have been handed out, the, both the CD-ROM and also the book that you've got. Starting at page 353 is uh, all of this plus a lot of other material as well in terms of the, the numbers of the patents that apply to Kerberos. Uh, just a lot more detail than you probably want, but it's all there in the page 353, including a contact information for me later if you'd like to have that. Um, so I'm going to be talking about these problems with respect to propriety protocols and extensions. I'm going to end up by concluding that if you control the protocol and you control the standard, you can control not only the specific uh, software, of course, that is using those protocols, but it extends far broader than that to many, many other markets as well. And I'll explain how, how that works. We'll be talking about interoperability, closed and open standards, how difficult that is really uh, to understand and the kinds of problems that judges and the legal system have with that. And I'll use Kerbos just, just as an example. The second part of my uh, talk will be about uh, public and private law, how the law tries to balance public and private interests, and how the uh, protocols that we have with propriety, proprietary protocols undermine what the law tries to do. And then I'll end up talking about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the new draft of the U.S. Patriot Act, U.S. Patriot Act II, or Son of, Son of Patriot Act, and the, uh, the, the uh, possible effects that that's going to have, especially on the work that we do in encryption, specifically. So first of all, let me talk about standards. Um, this is obvious, I suppose, but standards are critical. Uh, you've got to have them for interoperability, especially in a distributed uh, network and distributed computing. It almost, by definition, uh, people have to be playing by the same rules. The security standards are especially important. I mean, Phil was just talking this morning. Phil, as you probably know, Phil Zimmerman uh, released a PGP a long time ago, was investigated by the, uh, by the U.S. government during a transaction in a time period where I represented him. Uh, he was accused of being the devil incarnate uh, by the U.S. government, uh, whereas, in fact, what Phil did was brought encryption standards to uh, widespread encryption standards to the net and really was uh, one of the central figures that was responsible for giving trust uh, to the network so that people could um, exchange encrypted uh, data, uh, which is ultimately good, good for business. The problem with standards and protocols is what I call the tipping effect. The tipping effect is when you have a standard which becomes popular up to a certain point, and then the developers in the world realize that if they want to play ball, they really have to write to that standard. They think maybe it's 60, 70 percent of the market uh, is adhering to a certain kind of a standard, a certain kind of protocol. The next wave of developers comes along and realizes that if they want to play ball, they really should write to that standard. 
Users have a look at what's available, what's out there, what the applications are. Users then go to that standard. Developers see how many users are going to the standard. Developers then write more to the standard. By the time you're done, you have the so-called tipping effect in which one standard, one set of protocols, one way of doing business really becomes dominant, profoundly dominant. And if you look at the Windows versus Apple a development in a different context, you'll see what happened there. If you're a developer and you have to choose between writing for the Apple OS, Mac OS and, and Windows, and each is going to take approximately the same amount of time, you probably want to go for Windows because of the user base. And I, when I'm trying to decide which kind of a machine to buy, for that reason, unless I have a special need for what Apple uh, provides to me, I'm going to go to Windows, and we're going to have this sort of network effect, which tips to one standard. I call this a virus effect. It's very important when it comes to standards and, and protocols. So let's talk just a few minutes about standards, open, closed, and so on. This is very, very confusing stuff. And it's confusing not only within the technical community, but once you get into court and you talk to judges about what's an open or a closed standard, what you own, what you don't own, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, this stuff gets out of control very, very quickly. Um, those, there's open source. There's published source, of course, which is different. There's free. There's not free. APIs can be disclosed at a variety of different levels. They can be disclosed at a very high level, which is useful for writing an application. They can be disclosed at a lower level in more detail, so you can actually replicate um, the API and write your own, in a sense. We have specifications which can be detailed at a variety of different levels, enough maybe just to write to and to use, or enough to implement the, uh, the technology on a completely different platform and literally substitute in a different product. These are all different levels of, uh, of what, quote, open might mean. And I can't resolve it now because it all depends on the context in which, in which you're discussing it. And you'll see this comes back in about 15 or 20 minutes, this kind of a confusion. There are various levels of interoperability. Uh, I've been involved in a number of cases in which interoperability was promised, let's say, by a vendor to a customer. And nobody really discussed what that meant. <clears throat> and that led to a lawsuit, which was good for me and bad for the clients. So what interoperability means, whether it just means you can exchange data back and forth or a certain kind of data back and forth, or whether you can actually take out piece A and put in uh, piece B, uh, are things that have to, that are confusions that we have in the concept of interoperability. Now there are reasons for closed standards. You're gonna hear me talking and arguing for, for open standards or open specifications, but it's very important, I think, to be even-handed. Uh, there are reasons for it. Number one, you may want to try and control a market, and that is not always an evil thing to do in this country. Uh, trying to get large market share, trying to get a large uh, piece of the developer mindset, trying to create a community um, of standards is not an evil thing. Um, there are also difficulties with public law. In other words, you may feel that the patent uh, regime or the copyright regime is not good enough to protect the amount of work that you have put in to a technology. And therefore, using closed standards and licensing it out may be the only way you can really recoup the money that you've put into your, your R&D. You may be frustrated uh, by the standards that are out there already. You may look at a standard. You may look at, let's say, plain XML and say, this is not enough. This is not good enough. I need more. I'm going to be doing digital rights management, for example. And what's out there right now is not enough for the product that I want to build. I've got to put in an extension. I've got to modify it. I've got to have a derivative language, and I've got to do this <clears throat> even though what I am doing is not in every respect been approved by some sort of standards body. Desire for new features is really the same, another way of saying the same thing. From a customer point of view, having skin in the game, as it were, is, is also very important. If you have built something and created it and owned it as a developer, as a, as a company that is responsible for a certain kind of technology, you're responsible, not not a standards body, not a group of people who are spread out around the world who are sort of doing this as a hobby, but if you personally, your company is directly responsible for it, that can be an encouraging thing for customers. They may know who to go to when they need a fix. They may know what the, uh, what the, what the schedule is going to be of updates and so on. And reaping the rewards of innovation I've, I've, uh, I've discussed before. You build something, you own it, you can license it out, you can get money back. So there are reasons for proprietary or, or closed standards. But there are also problems uh, with these. Um, as you'll see as we talk about, once you have a standard, especially an encryption standard, which is authenticating users, authenticating services, authenticating computers across an entire network, 
the, the, he who controls that protocol is going to end up controlling lots and lots of different pieces of the network, from the software to the hardware level, and as we're seeing with uh, the new Intel Palladium um, initiative, all the way down to the chip level. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. So ownership of this is not always in the public interest. It can diminish, in fact, interoperability. Even though standards are designed for interoperability, that's their, really, their only reason to exist, you can have a situation, as you'll see with Kerberos, where the consequence is actually a, a standard that not everybody can buy into, and it then breaks interoperability between various pieces of, of, a, of, a, of systems, pieces that would like to be communicating with each other that can't. You increase switching costs. If you buy into a certain kind of a protocol, if you buy into a standard, if you buy into a format, then you're locked in. You are probably locked in. It's probably what the manufacturer wanted to have happen. It's a legitimate manufacturer uh, goal, but it doesn't mean that it's in your best interest in the long run. Two or three years when you want to upgrade or move to a completely different system, it may be very, very tough at that point to change. Uh, one example is, uh, you know, if you have Word documents and you want to transform those Word documents into something else. I remember when I had CPM, I've still got all my three and a half inch, uh, all my five inch disks from the CPM days, I, had them, I transmitted them to DOS. I didn't do it all. And you know, I've got a lot of different file formats sitting in my house, which are now just uh, relics of, of history. And, and I've, I've lost that data. That's OK for me as an individual, but it's not OK for a company. Closed standards also puts your future to a single company sometimes. You're hitching your star to, to one system. And especially in the security uh, and encryption area, a closed standard can be the wrong way to go. Um, there are those who believe in so-called the security through obscurity. That is, if I don't tell you how my encryption system works, then I've reduced the odds that anybody's going to be able to break it. I personally don't believe in that. I don't think a lot of people around here uh, at this conference probably believe in that. The best way to get security is to publish the source, is to publish the specifications, to have everybody have a look at it, and then turn everybody loose to see if they can break it. And, uh, and only then can you turn around and I think and tell the customer that you've got something that works. If the only reason your system is secure is because you've kept a secret, you are doomed. And uh, the Kerbero story is a story of, of a leaked secret, as we'll get to in a second. Uh, in the last part of my talk, I'll talk about how the closed systems also threaten the public law balance, which I'll get to later. And then you have legal costs. Again, very good for people like myself who work in uh, large law firms that so we have people battling each other over whether somebody owns or doesn't own a proprietary extension or has a trade secret or has something which can be licensed. It's great for me and it keeps me busy, but the increased overhead that this represents for consumers and for the manufacturers uh, is very significant, very significant. Standards are across markets. Um, the, I think the dream of having platforms or at least having operating systems or having protocols that reach across all of these different sorts of form factors is very, very, very close. Uh, people have been talking about this now for a long time, but transmitting data information among whether it's handhelds, phones, uh, servers, a variety of web services and so on is going to be, um, is right around the corner and for many of us is, is here right now. So we have this network world where you have one standard protocol format, whatever it might be, um, it's going to have this tendency not only to have a viral effect that I talked about, that have more and more people sort of adopting it within a context, but the contexts themselves are going to ramify. You're going to have more and more and more of these things out there. Microsoft, for example, would like to have Windows on each one of uh, the small devices that we carry around with ourselves. Sun Microsystems would like to have the same thing. I mean, Java is supposed to run everywhere, on the handheld, on the server, on the client, and so on. This is a, a noble goal that, that people are going for. But it means that when you buy into one of these protocols, you're buying into a lot. We've talked about open and closed systems. There are, the problem is that a lot of these things are actually what I call standards ajar. It's a bad word. And if somebody has a better, better way to sort of capture this, I'd love to hear it. But they're not open and they're not closed, is what I'm getting at. You can have proprietary extensions of public protocols. And Kerberos, as you'll see in a second, is a great example of an extension that Microsoft made in an area that was actually contemplated by the designers of the public protocol, and yet it's a private extension. And we'll see how that works. So 
this generates a tremendous amount of confusion. People don't know whether they're allowed to use it or they're not allowed to use it or what the terms and conditions are. Anybody who's worked with the, um, with the open source licensing uh, area knows how confusing some of those licensing uh, issues are and what it covers. Kerberos. I'm going to go through this quickly again because I am not the expert on Kerberos. I'm just setting this up as an example of something so I can talk about some of the legal issues um, in a minute. The great thing about Kerberos is that it's a marvelous example of confusion about what public and private really means in this context. MIT came up with the Kerberos encryption standard and gave it to the public. So it's a public, it's a public standard. But it now has these Microsoft proprietary extensions. What it allows you to do is have authentication across realms, that, are, that is across networks, and indeed through a series of servers. You can authenticate yourself to server one, which the, then turn around and authenticate yourself to server two, and so on and so forth. You'll see how this works. And it's of very great importance, um, both in digital rights management networks uh, generally. And the great benefit of it in one sentence is that no password is ever exchanged in the open. So sniffing and having a look at what's being exchanged between the client and the server won't do you any good because every single required uh, communication is actually encrypted. So basically the way it works is you've got a client, that's you, sitting down as a user requesting credentials. You make that request to the authentication server. The authentication server itself contains a database of users and authenticated servers um, and, and users and their secret keys. And then the authentication server turns around, provides a credential to you, the client, which is encrypted with a secret key, so that even if somebody is sniffing that transmission, it can't be uh, disclosed. Once you, you've, these credentials that the user now has includes a ticket to access a server plus a session key, which is only good for a limited amount of time. This ticket is then used by the client to access the server that he wants to, to access. And the session key is, is a shared key between that client and the server. And you end up with a situation where the server, the client, are all authenticated to each other. So you have, a, you have an assurance that you're talking to the correct service, and the service has an assurance that it's talking to an authenticated user. My, my artwork. Number one at the top, you'll see the request for the credential over to the right. The session key is generated. The PAC I'll get back to in a second. That's the privilege access certificate that Microsoft has inserted, and we'll talk about in a second. That's part of the ticket that is then given back to the user in step two. Step three, that is then used to request service from the ticket granting server, which then provides it back to the user in step four. And once the user has then been authenticated, he can communicate with the uh, in step five with the actual service that he wants to use. This is impossible to read here and is in your materials, <clears throat> but it has a little bit more detail about what I've just talked about. Now, Kerberos had been out for a while, and Microsoft, uh, which had been using a different authentication protocol, decided to jump on the bandwagon and announced that Windows 2000 was going to use version 5.0 and be compatible with version 5.0 of Kerberos. And it announced it that as a signing up to an open protocol. This was, this was the approach that Microsoft took. We are signing up to an open authentication protocol. It's a press release in the year 2000. And everybody trumpeted this that the default authentication protocol for Windows 2000 and XP was going to be Kerberos version 5. Now, what happened was, uh, and I've just privately done this on my own initiative, kind of looked around to see what the story is in terms of ownership with respect to Kerberos. You would expect not to find any. Well, it turns out there's a whole bunch of patents. I found six that claim ownership. Patents have been issued with respect to Kerberos and various aspects of it. Some of the inventors uh, work for Microsoft and some do not. Um, and those patents are listed uh, in your materials. But the so-called privilege access certificate, which I'll talk about in a minute, was a field which the developers of Kerberos left open. And Microsoft had created a proprietary extension with respect to that field and uh, claimed it as a trade secret. What Microsoft did was they inserted a so-called security identifier in, in the privileged attribute uh, certificate, which is that thing that goes back to the user in, in step two. What this does, it's got a completely legitimate uh, function. It supports the Windows domain controller so that um, Kerberos interacts with uh, Windows domain controller and knows who the, uh, who the users are. And this is happening within what, what uh, 
Microsoft calls the uh, key distribution center, which is the um, which is the authentication server. It's the same thing as the authentication server in the in the old uh, MIT Kerberos implementation. And Active Directory is uh, is what Microsoft has installed there, and the privileged attribute certificate interacts with uh, Active Directory. Now, if you had an open pack field, in other words, if the specifications that Microsoft uses were completely open, it would allow non-Microsoft products to imitate a Windows domain controller. And that's the problem from Microsoft's point of view. So right now, at least as of August 2002, which is the last time I was able to see something in the public uh, about this, it is impossible to imitate or to create without getting a license from Microsoft. You cannot imitate the functionality of a Windows domain controller in the Kerberos context. So the reports came out. It's, I'm not the person who's called this an interoperability problem. Um, others, including one of our speakers, is Bruce Sneer, who's going to be giving the, uh, the, uh, the speech, I think, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, have noted that Microsoft's implementation is incompatible with the rest of the Kerberos world. Microsoft enforced this, first of all, by keeping it a secret, a trade secret. And we'll talk about trade secrets uh, in a few minutes. This is what I'm, and that's, that's really what I'm setting up with this discussion. So first they kept it secret. Then they released the specification of it, but to get the specification of the uh, PAC field, of the PAC field, what you had to do is you had to actually run a program, an EXE program, which presented a click-through contract which required you to promise to treat everything that you were getting as a trade secret. You had to read through this contract, and only after you had clicked through and said, I accept all the terms and I agree with you, Microsoft, that what you're about to disclose to me is a trade secret, uh, were you allowed to have a look at the specifications. So, you gotta, so Microsoft was able to say that they had disclosed the specifications, but there was no permission inside of that license agreement to actually implement it. The license agreement, when you read it very carefully, allowed you to inspect the specifications but there was no right to implement it in any way. To do that, you had to go back to Microsoft and get further permission. So you had this sort of infinite distribution to the entire world of a trade secret, which sounds like an oxymoron. It's kind of funny. Now, what happened after that is the beans were spilled. Slashdot um, got a hold of this. Some of the folks there got a hold of this. I think it was one of the guys who goes by the, the handle Anonymous Coward, and published everything. Took the license agreement, put it up, got the extra specifications, put it up. Microsoft threatened them. There was a huge fight. There's a great discussion, which is still archived on Slashdot, which is actually really fun to read. And um, the, the lawsuit was never actually brought. But the specifications, everything is still there. I can't show it to you because that would be wrong. But uh, it's up there at Slashdot for anybody to, to have a look at. But even so, uh, a number of people who have looked at it say that there's not enough disclosure there. Even that doesn't allow you to actually replicate the, uh, the server side of the Kerberos functionality, without which, of course, you have no Kerberos functionality at all. What's the effect of this? What's the effect of, of having a standard which is extended by a private company, put out into the world, and various people start writing to it? What happens is that it pushes to the user base, it pushes a platform that you may or may not want, but you go to it because you need the interoperability that that special flavor of that protocol provides to you. So you, for example, you may go to a, a Windows a server software where under other circumstances perhaps you have gone to Linux or something else. It pushes certain kinds of technology which otherwise you might not want. Maybe you do, but you might not want them. Active Directory, uh, Passport, which is a single sign-on uh, technology, has, a, some, has some kind of Windows Kerberos uh, proprietary extension in it. People who uh, want this kind of stuff will end up probably buying into the Windows family of products. And again, as I said before, it'll end up increasing switching costs, and you've really signed up for security through, the, through confidentiality or obscurity. So that's just the setup of one example of, of, a private, of, a, of a public protocol that was supposed to be open to everybody and allow complete interoperability among all platforms sort of being taken over by a private company and to some extent, to a limited extent, really becoming a proprietary system. And the question is, what's the problem with that? Outside of the sort of some of the practical difficulties that I've talked about, 
What are the, some of the legal issues that, that that represents? Let me set it up by just talking about public law for a second. What law obviously tries to do, and this is you know 200,000 foot level, and I'll go through this quickly because I don't, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but it obviously tries to draw a balance between private interests on the one hand and sort of the public interest in getting certain things and certain things done. And it has two components. Law really has two components. What I call substantive law and procedural law. Substantive law is like, what's your right? It, it, you, you know, the legislature gets together, they make a deal, you know, we'll, we'll have patent protection, but it's only good for 20 years and you get to have this stuff, but after 20 years the public gets it, or you have a copyright right, but it's limited, or you have some trademark rights, and I'll get to that in a second or a trade secrets, whatever, we're going to have this balance, we're going to write the law like this, we think that this is the right balance of public and private interest, and here's the law. The law is you can't go more than 25 miles an hour, the law is that you, you have to register for copyright, whatever. That's substantive law, what the law is. And then there's procedural law, which is how it gets enforced. It's the courts, it's the judges, and we buy into that whole system, the marshals knocking at your door, the subpoenas, the judges with the power to lock you up if you're in contempt, we buy into that because we have bought into the substantive law. We believe at our, somewhere, at some level, that the substantive law is right, and that's why we buy into the procedural law. That's the theory. So, substantive public law. Again, that's where the balancing is done, it's the rights of various individuals and the public, public values. And these are all, every law really can be seen as one of these, as a limitation of private freedom of action to impose some sort of a public benefit. Um, and for, for example, you can't have illegal contracts. This is an, ex you can't have a contract to kill. That's not going to get enforced because even though you may think that you have a private right to make any contract that you want, the courts are not going to use their procedural powers to enforce it. Zoning, noise regulation, I mean, there's a million laws like this. Campaign contribution law, for example, limiting your First Amendment right to contribute with the public benefit that you don't want to have too much corruption with unlimited contributions. Speed laws, all of these things are sort of the balancing of substantive laws. Intellectual property laws are really the same sort of thing. You have a copyright right, you have a right to stop other people from copying your stuff, but it's balanced. It's only good for a certain number of years. It only protects a certain amount of, of what you have. Patent laws are the same way. We'll give you your private right to a patent, but it expires after a certain amount of time. Trademarks are the same way. Microsoft, Sun Microsystems, Yahoo, all these people, everybody has, they have these trademarks, but they can't stop you from using it in any context. I've got the word Microsoft up here and I can't be stopped because I've got a right to use it. So that we have these balances. Trade secrets are one of the most interesting ways that we have this sort of a balance, and this is where the Kerberos extensions and so on come in. Trade secrets are probably the most dangerous right that is out there. Number one, it's cheap. It doesn't cost anything to have a trade secret established. Trade secrets can last forever. There's no term. It can be hundreds and hundreds of years for a trade secret. And they're highly elastic. Anything can be a trade secret. As long as it gives you competitive benefit and you keep it confidential, it can be a trade secret. I mean, if, you've just, if you found out that sitting down at 3 o'clock in the morning on pink cushions gives your company an added benefit and productivity, and you keep it confidential, that can be a trade secret. It can be as serious or silly as you want. And they're criminal predicates. When people take a trade secret and they misappropriate a trade secret or they use it illegally, it's not only the civil law that kicks in, but it's also a criminal problem in both state and federal law. At the same time, trade secrets are very, very, very delicate. A leak can kill the trade secret. Once it gets out, it's gone. This concept, an elastic tape measure law, is a concept that, uh, that I just used to describe where this model sort of, of balancing really breaks down. It's where the substantive law, the substantive rights are not subject to any kind of balancing at all, but the whole procedural law, the courts, the subpoenas, the judges all kick in to protect the private right, even though that private right is nothing that has ever been subjected to that sort of balancing that we see in the legislature. And the area that we work in, in terms of security and internet uh, and computers, is a great example of where we have these elastic tape measure laws. As you probably know, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and a lot of other state laws that uh, make it a crime or a civil problem to enter a, quote, unauthorized area of a site uh, is a great example. This is an example of where a private individual can define what's right and what's wrong. 
So you can have a, uh, a legend on your website saying to certain people, you are not authorized to go here, you're not authorized to do that. And uh, entering into an unauthorized area is, at least under the uh, literal language, a, a federal crime. Trade secret is another great example. As you recall, anything can be a trade secret. So once you've got a trade secret, once you've defined whatever it is that's a trade secret and you've kept it confidential, the law, this law kicks in to provide criminal and civil penalties for anybody who misappropriates that. But you're the one who decided what's inside of that box. Contracts with some limited exceptions are the same sort of thing. The courts usually say that with a, with a very few exceptions, you can agree to anything you want. If you're over 18 and you sign a contract, you are liable. And it can be the most absurd sort of contract. The courts will step in and with very rare exceptions will enforce that contract. You can put anything you want inside of that box. Now, one of the things about fair use, fair use is one of these things in the copyright issue, which actually I'll, I want to move through it now, and, and I'll get back to that in a second. Well, let, let me just briefly talk about fair use because it comes up later. Fair use is a balancing act tool with respect to copyright. It's embodied in the Copyright Act. And it allows people without permission to use and to copy. And it can be used to avoid the impact of these proprietary protocols and extensions. And the, re the usual way that fair use is, uh, is handled is that you can quote, use, display, publish stuff without permission if it's for one of these purposes, comment, criticism, news reporting, and so on. But for our use, for our purposes today, one of the most interesting ways in which fair use kicks in is that fair use includes the right to go into a technology and to reverse engineer it, to disassemble it, to have a look at it. And especially if your purpose is to create interoperability, com interoperable components and code, you can go into a technology without permission be under the doctrine of fair, of fair use. So that's one way that the law tries to balance this stuff out. Now, what's actually happened with respect to proprietary extensions and the law is that the balance that we sort of have all bought into in other sorts of contexts has really been upset. What's happened is that the procedural law, the, the subpoenas, the courts, and so on, have all been used not to enforce public values or public statutes, but private interests. In the old days, of course, you had any leak would destroy a, a trade secret. And that's why trade secrets in the old days, by old days, I'm going to pretend, you know, 16th, 17th century, were really processes that occurred behind the doors. Once the product was released, anybody could look at the product, and there would be anything that was disclosed by any inspection of the product couldn't possibly be a trade secret, because it would have been disclosed. But now what we've got with, uh, with computer software, computer software can be sent out to the world in its object code format. Computer software can be implemented in a variety of contexts. It can be distributed in the entire universe. But that doesn't mean that how it's working is actually disclosed. So you have this sort of magic weapon now with trade secrets, where you can have a trade secret as the way it works. You can have require people to sign license agreements that they will keep the information secret. And presto, you put those two things together, and you've got massive, widespread distribution out into the public of something that is subject to trade secret law, which is very, very peculiar. The trade secret law, trade secrets usually dissolved once they were put into the public light. If you use the trade secret outside of the scope of the license, then it's a breach of contract. And it's a trade secret infringement. At that point, the law steps in. You can be sued and there are both civil and criminal procedural laws. Both the federal legal system and the state legal systems allow for the indictment and criminal prosecution of people who violate license agreements and misappropriate trade secrets, regardless of what the trade secret is, as long as it's honestly a trade secret. So we have, this is the problem that we've ended up with. And the issues that this sort of raises, which, which obviously we can't, I can't resolve, but the issues that this raises are whether we have these contractual restrictions should in fact supersede copyright law and fair use. Because what's happening is that these license agreements that people are being required to sign have a promise in the agreement that says you won't reverse engineer, you won't disassemble. So on one hand, you've got fair use law, you've got copyright law that allows you to reverse engineer, to take something without permission, to see how it works for the 
specific purpose of creating interoperable components. And on the other hand, you have signed an agreement that says you won't do it. And as you know, most software license agreements have that kind of clause. I draft them myself, and I put them in the license agreements for my clients. So how does that work out? What's the story? Which one, which one supersedes? Do you have this statutory right, or don't you have this statutory right? The way the courts handle this is they say, you know, any right can be waived. I mean, just because you have a right doesn't mean you can't waive it. If you get arrested for first-degree murder and you want to waive a jury, which is a constitutional right, you can do it. You can even plead guilty if you want to. You can waive your, white, uh, waive your right to a trial. So judges are used to people waiving rights. And they say, if you sign that license agreement, you've waived all of the rights that you may have. So the default is that the license agreement usually trumps. The default is that the rights that you have to disassemble, reverse engineer, and inspect things outside the context of a license agreement get blown away by the way courts actually understand this stuff. What are courts thinking? What are judges thinking when they do this? They're thinking, you're a grown up, free choice, you didn't have to do it, you decided to do this, maybe you negotiated the contract. It assumes these sort of ideal market forces, which, which is really not true. I mean, by and large, people sign contracts or enter into a contracts whether they want to or not. There's no negotiation with respect to most software license contracts. Only among the largest companies is there such, is there such a negotiation. And increasingly in the law as well, we have situations where courts say you were on notice of the terms. Even if you didn't read the contract, you're still bound by it. And this happens repeatedly, um, where you have situations in which, for example, you go onto a website, you didn't look at the terms and conditions. The court said, well, you should have known that they were there. You're bound by it. You have to arbitrate in Virginia or whatever it might be. So there is an illusion of consent that underlies this stuff. I wanted to finish up with a couple of new statutory threats to the ability to reverse engineer and to get around private uh, extensions and protocols. The Digital uh, Millennium Copyright Act has a ban on reverse engineering with respect to decryption security systems. It blows away fair use in a lot of contexts. And uh, some of the cases that talk about this are in the materials, and I'm not going to belabor it now because I want to stop in just a few minutes in case there are any questions. We've got uh, so-called baby DMCA acts. A lot of states are um, enacting statutes which are far worse than the Federal Digital Millennium Copyright Act. OK? Um, we have uh, recent extensions to the Copyright Act um, that, uh, that have just been approved by the Supreme Court. We've got UCEDA. Uh, UCEDA is the Uniform Computer Information Transactions Act, something similar to that, which has only actually been adopted by two states. It's a big fight. I think it was adopted in Maryland and, and uh, Virginia. Uh, but it validates a click, click Wrap Act, and it has a lot of other provisions in it that are pretty onerous with respect to users and the user's choice and ability to determine or negotiate uh, what the terms are for the use of software and information. What's funny is that um, two states have adopted it, and a lot of other states have now adopted so-called bomb shelter provisions, that is, provisions that say UCEDA may not be applied to our residents, the opposite of adopting a statute, saying that it cannot, cannot be applied to our residents. There's another statutory threat which I bring to your attention and suggest that you have a look at it. Uh, the site for this and the link for this, again, is in, in the materials. But the, uh, you, you know that there is currently the US Patriot Act. There is a US Patriot Act II, which is making uh, the rounds um, in the Hill and was published, um, not published by the White House, but was obtained by somebody and then, and then published. It's called the Domestic Security Enhancement Act. Criminalizes the use of encryption if uh, it was used to conceal evidence relating to any other federal crime. It, it really throws me back to uh, the old days when Phil Zimmerman was being investigated for the use of encryption in, in the United States. We had thought that we were sort of past that, uh, that encryption had become an ordinary tool, that uh, the use of encryption was something that, um, that had become accepted. Uh, but now with our new, quote, uh, terrorist uh, threats, uh, it's being used as an excuse to go back and have a look at this. The reason this is so broad is because uh, if you use encryption in connection with any other, quote, crime, uh, you're guilty of this new five to 10 year uh, felony. When you figure out what another federal crime is, it's a very, very broad category. First of all, copyright infringement can be a crime. And uh, we have a speaker uh, directly in front of me here who will be speaking 
later on, uh, I think, are you speaking later on today? Later on today at around uh, 1.30 or so, who's going to be talking about some of the criminal copyright issues. But copyright can be a crime. Copyright infringement can be a crime. So any use of encryption in respect to uh, this can trigger the new proposed act. And also, a lot of federal crimes include a lot of state crimes. So anything can end up being a federal crime. It undermines fair use, especially with respect to examining uh, encryption schemes. And as I said, there are a lot of these, there are criminal penalties and a risk of suit um, under that. So just in summary, what I've tried to at least flag without coming to a lot of resolution, but what I've tried to flag in the last 40 minutes is the need for interoperability. We've got increasingly complex and inter interdependent functions and standards with the distributed computing, so you've got a rationale for these, uh, for these protocols. Uh, there's a lot of new cases and legislation which are validating the restrictions on the technology so that Microsoft with respect to its proprietary extensions and other companies with respect to their proprietary extensions of so-called public protocols. It could be a, a variant of XML, it could be a variant of LDAP, it can be a variant of any of these protocols that we think that are out there in the public domain. The current legal regime is that those extensions are going to get protected by the courts and your ability to either reverse engineer them or to have a look at them or to create interoperable products without signing on to licenses that you don't actually want to sign on to are really restricted under the current legal regime. And he who owns the protocol owns the network. Because when you own the protocol and only those who enter into a license agreement with you can use that protocol, and if that protocol extends to a lot of other form factors and a lot of other platforms, the power of the owner becomes quite, quite broad to a lot of other sorts of technologies, especially when it comes to encryption protocols. So digital rights management, single sign-on, um, e-commerce just generally depends, of course, on encryption and authentication. And it goes all the way down from high-level structure like Kerbos, and these things are implemented all the way down into chips. As you know, the Intel and the Microsoft and others are uh, coming up with a new technology which is likely to be implemented in Longhorn, which is going to have authentication and um, digital rights management all the, way down to the, uh, all the way down to the chip level. So when you buy your computer, you're literally buying into the uh, technology. And this takes information and knowledge away from the public, from the public domain. So, you know, what do we need? I, my suggestion is simply in the security context. I'm not, I'm not arguing for open, for open source. I'm not necessarily arguing for freely accessible source or for free licensing. These things have to be um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, I'm not going to generalize for, for all possible variants of public platforms. But it's a sensitivity I think we should have. And when it comes at least to standards and protocols, um, certainly open and full disclosure of specification, especially in the security context, is really something that we want to try and have. The additional resources and appendices that come with this materials, there's an abstract of this talk, biography, a variety of sites. The Kerberos uh, license agreement, a portion of it that Microsoft was having people uh, step through is in the materials. Some cases on uh, fair use, the Kerberos patents, and then some excerpts from the uh, new draft US Patriot Act and the digital millennium copyright materials. And I'd love to discuss I've gone through this very, very quickly. I, I know that I haven't explained every single step. Um, but if anybody wants to have questions or chat about any angle of any angle of this, I'd, I'd love to talk about that. Yes, sir, way in the back. Right. This is an extremely important point. I couldn't agree with you more. And if I can re re rephrase the point and then address it, I, I think what you're pointing out is that we have a system in which people 
like lawyers and judges who know nothing about the technology, don't even know how to operate a VCR, have just gotten to the point where they can push buttons on a telephone, are deciding what uh, a protocol means, what a standard means, what, what techno how technology works, and whether something makes sense, whether something is reasonable or unreasonable. There are a lot of laws, in fact, which depend on, especially when you get to a jury, and a lot of these cases ultimately will end up in front of a jury as the ultimate decision maker, where you need to explain this stuff and you have to rely on a common sense understanding of what's going on. And what common sense is to a lawyer or a judge isn't anything like what a common sense might mean to, to somebody who's deeply involved in, in the technology. And that is one of the biggest challenges of being a lawyer in this context. And it's one of the reasons that you know, I write about this stuff and I talk about this stuff, to try and explain the legal system to the technologists and try and explain then the technology to the judges. Now, you know, fortunately, there are some judges who are willing to learn, um, especially where I practice in, the, in Northern California. Uh, we have both in our state and federal courts, a lot of very smart judges who will sit down and get a tutorial. When you have a case, you actually take an expert and you get an expert up on the stand who tries to explain this stuff in plain English. You have a you parade of experts who come up to do this. But as you well know, experts can be completely abused as well. They can fake stuff, make stuff up, and just sort of have a lot of puffery. Um, but it's not just a problem with technology. You know, there are a lot of other cases, when you think about it, there are a lot of other cases where the legal system has the same problem. Imagine an airplane accident. Uh, we represent Boeing. Uh, and Boeing every now and then has lawsuits brought against it because of some problem with an airplane. And you need to explain how that worked. What went wrong and why it is or it isn't somebody's fault. Was it a maintenance issue? Was it a design issue? car accidents. When you actually think about it, there are lots and lots of different cases involving all sorts of different kinds of technology where you've got to educate the, the decider as to how this stuff works. So in abstract, the system is fine. In the abstract, the system is designed to handle the problem. In truth, and I think this is where your question is going, in truth, it doesn't work at all. It doesn't work because the judges and the court systems are overwhelmed. I've been in court often where I've got a complex motion, the guy and the judge says, Kate, you got a minute. You got one minute. Go ahead. <laughs> the judges have 70, 80 cases, 80 hearings they're sometimes taking in a morning. Um, it is impossible under the current judicial system to get the kind of time and attention you need for some of these complex cases. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem. Um, yes, sir. Right. D the differences in law. That's happening in the Microsoft case. I mean, Microsoft itself, I think, is, is feeling torn between some of the demands of the commission over in Europe and America. In privacy law, we have uh, differing requirements between European privacy requirements and American privacy requirements. So you have American companies like American Airlines, um, United Technologies, a variety of other companies that are trying to adhere to American law with respect to the use of uh, privately identifiable information, but it's in violation of European law. And now, and, now the, and now Europe has passed a law that says if you violate our laws, wherever you are in the world, we will assert jurisdiction against you here in Europe. Um, and trying to negotiate those things is, is pretty interesting as well. That happens all over the place. Yes, sir. The question is, uh, when you have a pretty good idea of what kind of a case you've got, to what extent and do you judge shop? That is, to what extent can you kind of pick a judge or pick a court or, or pick what the venue is going to be? Uh, and the answer to this is we do it as much as we possibly can. Um, there's no question about that. We're limited to some extent as to what choices we've got where to bring a case. Um, for example, uh, if, you're, if the injury takes place in a certain location, if your client is in a certain location, you will probably try and bring the case in that location. It's cheaper. And if the other side is in Boston, and I'm in, uh, let's say, San Jose, or I'm in San Francisco, I will try and bring the case in San Jose or San Francisco because it's going to be a bitch for the other side. And they're going to try and do the same thing to me. 
But once I'm inside an area, once I'm inside, let's say, the Northern District of California, where there are 20, 30 judges, or once I'm in San Francisco, state court, where there are about 70 judges or so, to what extent can I judge shop then? To what extent can I pick a judge out of the people who are in that building? Almost none. There's almost nothing I can do to pick a specific judge. If I want to pick a specific person to, run my, to operate my case, what I can do is get together, and I've done this, I can get together with the other side, and we can arbitrate it. So for example, there is a retired judge in San Francisco who I think is great. Smart guy, he's retired, makes you know, $500 an hour. Um, and me and the other side, two law firms, we represented two technology companies that had a $5 million problem. And we picked this guy. And we said, you're going to be our judge. We'll pay you your hourly rate. And you're the guy. And you can do that. But if the other side doesn't agree, you're usually at least stuck within a courthouse. You can't pick the individual judge. Yeah. No, there are very specific, specific to trade secret criminal statutes. And they exist in the um, federal law. There's a federal law that makes it a federal crime to traffic in trade secrets. There are state laws all over the country that make it a state crime to traffic in trade secrets. And there are pieces of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act which make it a federal crime to traffic in devices which are used to, uh, or can be used to decrypt without authorization. Sounds a little vague. Should scare you. I mean, the vaguer the law is, the worse it is. And the language on the Digital Copyright Millennium Act, for example, is in the end of the materials uh, that I have in the book. So there are, they're very specific to encryption laws. They're very specific to trade secret laws, both at the federal state, and they make it a crime. Now, just because it's a crime doesn't mean you're going to get indicted. Uh, you need to have a, uh, a prosecutor who wants to go after you. But, you know, I'm a good example. I was a prosecutor right out of law school, and I was about, uh, what, I was about 23 years old, and all of a sudden I was a federal prosecutor, and I could indict anybody I wanted. So that's the kind of person you have to deal with. It's not very pleasant. You know, I thought I should go after some people. We indicted them, and we prosecuted them. So prosecutors have a lot of discretion. The people who went after Phil Zimmerman, for example, were just trying to make some kind of a political point. I defended a case in Texas where there was a young prosecutor who went after a couple of people because he wanted to be the cyberspace prosecutor. Great. So, you know, the laws are on the books, and it's really impossible sometimes to predict whether they're going to get enforced or how they're going to get enforced. But there are specific criminal trade secret laws on the books. Any other questions or chats? Way in the back there in the red shirt. Yes, sir. The, the question, I think, is the extent to which uh, your right to reverse engineer depends on whether you bought the thing legitimately to begin with. And that is a very important point. Uh, it, it does. Because um, generally speaking, the, uh, if you don't acquire the item in the first place legitimately, if you don't have an initial legitimate right to have the item in your possession, then it becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible, to say that you had a fair use right to reverse engineer it. But um, by the same token, uh, the fact that you have legitimately bought, let's say, an Xbox and you start taking it apart doesn't necessarily give you automatically the right to reverse engineer it, especially if you sign some kind of a license agreement. Now, with an Xbox and things that you buy at, at Best Buy and things like that, it's sometimes, you know, there, there is no license agreement to that, to that stuff. Um, but uh, in, the, in the software area, if you're in the business, usually you have signed an agreement to get the right to get it into your possession. And that agreement, right around page 97, subparagraph I, little i, 2, 3, E, will have that clause that says you agree not to reverse engineer it. So even though you've legitimately got it in your possession, 
you've signed an agreement, or the court will say this is good as you've signed an agreement, that you may not reverse engineer. So that when you do reverse engineer it, you're guilty of breach of contract and unauthorized disclosure of a trade secret. Yeah, Eric. The question is whether I have any comments on the uh, SCO Linux fiasco, and I, I can't comment on that because I'm engaged. It's a, I represent Sun, and we're engaged. All I can say is Sun signed a license. Yes, sir. This is a really interesting development. Uh, the, the, the speaker questioner here was pointing out that in New York, the Attorney General is really stepping up to the plate a little bit and is objecting to some of these so-called contracts of adhesion. That is, contracts which, you know, you kind of take it or leave it, and they've got a lot of small print that nobody can understand, and they subject you to a lot of uh, terms and conditions. And in New York, uh, there is some effort to, to say that maybe those are unconscionable or they're against the public policy of the state. And this is interesting because there are a couple of different things happening around the country that smell a lot like this. For example, we've, have, we've had a couple of decisions in California uh, by judges that have said there was an AOL case where AOL, you know, when you sign up with AOL, uh, you agree to whatever it is you agree to. I bet you nobody here has any clue of what you, maybe you sign up to. I certainly don't. But one of them is an agreement to arbitrate your claim in Virginia. So there you are in Madison, Wisconsin and you've agreed to arbitrate your $10 claim uh, in Virginia. Well, uh, in California, that was declared to be against public policy. The judge said, you know, that is just outrageous. We're just not going to enforce that. There are other cases, that's a venue issue. And there's a new statute now in California that just came into effect that very few people know about. It's a statute that says that if there is a small claims claim, that is a claim within the purview of small claims court, that means $5,000 or less, you cannot compel the person who wants to bring that small claims court to go to some other state. It has to be done here in California. Very neat. There are cases that saying if you're being compelled to arbitrate and you really didn't negotiate it and it's just a contract of adhesion, you cannot be compelled to arbitrate. You have a right to court. So there are things like this and there are various states that are starting to say things like this is against public policy. And the, and the bomb shelter statutes that I talked about are really in the, same, in the same sort of thing. You know, we see the statute floating around. We see that people are, are inadvertently or without really full consent signing up to statutes that say that they release all rights to this, that, or the other. We're not going to, we're going to say here in this, in state X, that that's against public policy of state X. So there are various judges and legislatures and in, in New York, the attorney general, who are looking at these contracts and saying, this is, the illusion of consent is just, we can't stomach this anymore. We need real consent. We need real understanding. We need the stuff to be in English. And, uh, and unless that's true, we're just not going to enforce these contracts. Yes, sir, in the white shirt. The, uh, the, the new recording industry efforts to uh, go ahead and prosecute, uh, there are going to be a number of cases brought within the next two months uh, on this. And the question is, here you've got a technology which uh, opens up files uh, without necessarily the intent of the user to do so. Uh, and whose problem is that? And there, it's a, kind of a complicated issue. I mean, in short, I think what the recording industry is going to try to do 
is only go after the good cases. I mean, they're only going to go after people where they can make a great showing that this person must have intended to open up a whole ton of files. So it's true that under the technology you're describing, you can, in fact, open up all sorts of pieces of the server, including stuff which is supposed to be trade secret, by the way. I mean, that's a real nightmare of some of this technology. But if you've actually opened up directories that have a lot of uh, music, copyrighted music on them, and that's really what's happened, and that's a snapshot that, that the recording industry is going to have, and that's what they're going to append to their, to their complaint, they're going to try and make a showing and only go after people where they can really make a great showing that this person must have intended to share music, unauthorized music files, um, and you know, that, that's what they did. There's a second part of your question, which is that what's the responsibility of the company for the employees? What's the responsibility of the parents for the kids? As a uh, father of a 16-year-old boy who is uh, online all the time, I'm very sensitive to this issue. You know, what, is, what are the responsibilities of, what are the indirect responsibilities? And that is another hour of presentation that I have on this computer, but in short, um, there are doctrines of indirect or vicarious liability which have the parents, the company, the university, whatever that supervising uh, entity is, uh, to be on the legal hook for these actions. And under a number of these doctrines, including the doctrine of vicarious liability, that supervising entity need not have known of the activity. They need not have known nor intended it to be fully liable uh, for that action. That, that, that's a kind of a shorthand. Yes, sir? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, GPL, the, the short answer is no, I don't know. Uh, but GPL is a real mess. I mean, it's a real, it's a great place for lawyers to, to make a lot of money. Um, specifically because, you know, we have clients coming to us and saying, look, we want to use this stuff, but, we, but the stuff that we develop, we want to keep separate. And we don't want to integrate this code. We don't want to have the new stuff that we write subject to the GPL license. And there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's one of these marvelous areas where people will create stuff and you just maybe have calls back and forth or, you know, how are you going to sort of architect this thing? And it's a great example of sort of confusion and ambiguity into whether or not uh, the, the final product, the final piece of software which has got public code in it is subject to the GPL license. Um, the GPL license is not a model of clarity. And I hope that someday, you know, there'll be some group of folks, I don't know, Eric, you and I should sit down and draft something and send it out. But, you know, some way to have a really good, enforceable, terrific GPL license which accomplishes what it's meant to do, and there'll be no ambiguity about it. But right now, it is fertile ground for, for litigation. Uh, the short answer is I don't know all the different contexts in which it's been applied or whether it's not. It, it, will, it would apply to any kind, of, any kind of code on its face. I think it is about time for me to leave so that the next session uh, can get started. I have to shut the computer down. I'm going to be outside. If anybody wants to chat more about any of these issues, uh, I would be delighted to do it. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>